Good day everyone, we are the group 5 and for today, we will be discussing the book Everyday Life by Ms. Cheryl Dissertau. So, these are the contents of our report. Let us first know who is Michel de Sertau. Sertau is a French-born polymath. When we say polymath, um, it means a person of wide-ranging knowledge or learning, or we can say um, he is basically a genius. Now, the practice of everyday life is considered as being enormously influential in pushing cultural studies away from the producer or product to the consumer. So, this will be further discussed by the reporters. Now, let's proceed with the background of the practice of everyday life. So, it was released as the R.C. Fah. His book focuses on how the ordinary man or the common hero operates and individualizes mass culture in everyday life. And as Dissert Tao puts it, his book shows how everyday life invents itself by pushing in countless ways on the property of others. He draws attention to the creativity of ordinary individuals who invent life for themselves. Basically, the practice of everyday life is an attempt to theorize the tactics and practices by which ordinary people subvert the dominant economic order from within. So, this Tao focuses on how, through his different ways of doing, ordinary man appropriates or reappropriates that is offered to him. Next, producers and users. So, Sir Tao starts off by stating that people are not merely passive and submissive consumers. Um, this is a connection with the Sir Tao's purpose for making the book right, uh, which was to examine the ways in which people individualize or manipulate mass culture, uh, altering things, rituals, laws, and language in order to make them their own. So, he begins his study by shifting the dichotomy between consumers and producers to users and producers. The producers or the ruling class are the ones who make the infrastructure of culture. Um, they're basically the authors, right? Um, they're the authors of law, literature, cityscapes, history, and science. While the users or the ordinary people are the ones who manipulate, poach, and alter those structure, both internalizing them and populating them. So, for Sir Tao, everyday practice is like a continuing investigation for the ways in which users, commonly assumed to be passive, which Sir Tao disagreed with, right? So, with that, we made three crucial points. For number one, he's simply saying that everyday practices are not only the background of social activity. The word articulate means to reveal systems composing culture. In order to do so, we must penetrate obscurity by applying theoretical questions, methods, and perspectives. Next, he says that the everyday practices doesn't primarily focus on individuality, but modes of operation. For the second one, he is saying that this is not entirely an analysis on individuals. He is more interested um, in the operations and actions people use every day. Lastly, the purpose of everyday practice is to make explicit. Emphasis on the word explicit is the systems that compose culture. In other words, he is saying that the goal of his work is to expose the actual everyday actions of consumers or users. Moving on, consumer production can be examined through four modes. First is what we call the usage or the consumption now. It says here that Michel de Certeau considers the uses to which social representation and modes of social behavior are put by the individuals or by groups. So with this understanding of the representation of the society and its modes of behavior, he considers that everyday practice is possible and necessary to include the determined component, the use of groups or individuals. So to further elaborate this point, here we have a concept map showing the relationship of the representation of a society, the modes and the behavior, the modes of the behavior and the use. 
Now, in light of the representation of the society and its modes of behavior, Michel de Surtout believes that it is both feasible and essential to incorporate the predetermined element of the usage of people or groups in our daily activities. Now, over here, we have an example applying what we have discussed in the previous slide. So, as you can see that in our concept map. Now, for example, the analysis of the images broadcasted by television, which is the representation of society, and of the time spent watching the television, which is the mode of behavior, should be complemented by a study of what the culture consumer makes or does during this time with this um, images. So the same goes for the use of the urban space, the products purchased in the supermarket, the stories and the legends distributed in our newspapers and so on. Now, District 2 says that this use or making or consumption is in itself what we call a silent production. Now, he says this because of two reasons. First, because it is scattered over areas defined and occupied by systems of production. So this means that the using and the consuming culture does not manifest itself through its own products but rather through its ways of using the products imposed by a dominant economic order. Now, the second reason is because it no longer leaves the consumers any place in which they can indicate what they make or do with the products of the system. So, from this statement, I know you might be thinking that it appears to be that the ordinary people or the users merely obey the dominant rational order, right? However, the Surtout suggests that consumers tactically challenge the strategies of the dominant group of producers and he sees this as a type of resistance. So, to illustrate this concept, here is an example by the Surtout. Now, in this example, so the Indians are approaching the culture forced on them by the Spanish colonizers. So, Instead of rejecting it, they use it for the purposes that Spanish did not intend or understand. Now, he is saying that the difference or the similarity could only be measured between the production of the image and the secondary production hidden in the process of its utilization. So here we have another concept to illustrate the concept. I mean, another concept map to illustrate the concept. So now, only the degree of manipulation, the disparity, and the resemblance between the primary production and the convert secondary production that occurs during its use could be measured. So users alter the dominant culture economy uh, in many ways to suit their own needs and set their own laws in order to make it conform to their preference, thus considered to be a secondary production. So now let us proceed to the procedures of everyday creativity. It says here that these ways of operating constitute the innumerable practices by which users reappropriate the space. Now if you recall with our previous examples that we have gave, it mentioned that Indians reappropriated the culture forced on them. So, if we think about it, a similar thing is happening in consumer culture, right? Here is a second bullet. So, pay particular attention to the phrase, compose the network of anti-discipline, which is a type of resistance. So, with this thought in mind, we can conclude that for Desert 2, ordinary people exercise the resistance through appropriating images products and space to their own interests within the framework laid out by the elite. Now, let's proceed to the formal structure of practice. Now, let's proceed to the formal structure of practices. This sort of supposed that operation are concealed within devices whose mode of usage they constitute, but it ends up lacking their own ideologies. In other words, you may think, there must be a logic behind these practices, right? We are thus confronted once again by the ancient problem, what is art or way of making? So it says here, 
that the dominant producers of popular culture are exercised as a technology of power, so as the way of operating. From this point of view, popular culture, as well as the whole literature called popular, take on a different aspect. They present themselves essentially as the arts of making, this or that is as combinatory or utilizing modes of consumption. Now, consumers present themselves as arts of making, as combinatory or utilizing modes of consumption. Right? Right. These practices bring into a play of popular ratio, a way of thinking invested in a way of acting, an art of combination which cannot be dissociated from any art of using. Now, popular culture on the other hand equates the art of making. Let's proceed to the marginality of majority. Take note that marginality in this context are cultural activities of the non-producers of culture. Take note of that. Non-producers of culture. Now, let us recall what was discussed by my co-reporter earlier. She mentioned that consumers' ways of operating create a network of anti-discipline. Through marginal groups tactically challenging the strategies of the dominant groups of producers, right? Which is why the Sorto believe that marginality is becoming universal, but it is a silent majority. He also defined marginals as those people who hardly pay for the showy products. Throughout the Sertao study, he kept mentioning the words strategies and tactics. Now, let's delve deep into these two terms and its manifestations in modern pop culture. Strategy and tactics, as the concepts are commonly understood, have their roots in military theory. Michel de Sertao, however, drew a distinction between the two terms that leaps over some of the martial history of these ideas. According to de Sertao, strategies are defined as the hidden means in which institutions or basically the producers generate relations with targeted individuals or consumers or the users. On the other hand, Tactics refers to individual actions of the ordinary people or the users in constantly manipulating events in order to turn them into opportunities. The setting of strategy knows this Tau is always the purview of power. So this means that the strategic leaders become the subject, then the lead and the enemy becomes the objects. In contrast to strategy, this Tau characterizes that Tactics as limited freedoms allowed by the frameworks of strategies. So, unlike strategies, tactics do not seek profits and are not results of planning but depend on the situations and the opportunities. So, in relation to this, a manifestation of tactics and strategies in pop culture is television series. Now, everyone is familiar with um, the HBO, right? So, it's home to some of our favorite show shows such as um, Game of Thrones, Euphoria. So, now HBO broadcasts these shows over certain channels during specific times and are mostly funded through advertising. So, in this case, the corporation and the advertisers are the dominant groups. So, they do this to gain profit, thus reinforcing the existing capitalist regime. So, they expect that the viewers will feed into this strategy. However, it is not what the audience or users always do. Now, the audience may simply ignore these advertisements or they record, upload, and share it to the internet, which is a form of appropriation which is what we discussed, right? Now, and even though pirating movies is illegal, it has become part of our pop culture. So we often see pirated movies and series posted on Facebook or even through illegal websites. So lastly, the audience can appropriate it by using it as an inspiration for one's own production, which is why there's what we call fan fictions, which are very famous. 
fan arts, even parodies of our favorite movies and series, seriousness. So, these are only some obvious ways in which the television audience can resist the strategies of the corporation through everyday tactics. So, according to Desert 2, we all use the mentally organized and understand spaces in our everyday life. So when we uh, enter a space, it conjures uh, certain thoughts. And through these thoughts, the spaces become connected to others. So this way, we tend to form and mix the memories and portray our stories. Now, according to him, a space exists when one takes into consideration the vectors of direction velocities and time variables so thus space is composed of intersections of mobile elements so a place on the other hand is an instantaneous configuration of positions it implies an indication of stability in this chapter 9 um, spatial stories he argues that space is a practice place so what does this mean? So it refers to the kind of stories we tell about where. So stories for Sir Tu thus carry out a labor that constantly transform places into spaces or spaces into places. To elaborate it further, this sort of gives the example of people walking on the street. He is saying that pedestrians transform the street into something functionable that is useful and pleasurable for them. However, the street's visible material aspect do not necessarily determine what will take place on it. A person could walk on and off the pathway, turn right or left at another street, draw on footpath with chalk, plant things on it, protest something, or even celebrate something else. Although the word street is definable, the street is not determined. So in relation to this, here we have an example that conveys a similar meaning. The city grid is a strategy, while how we choose to move within it is a tactic. So basically, for the Sertau, these walkers form spatial stories. Walkers transform empty places into lived spaces through improvisations, shortcuts, and wandering. Thus, the street is transformed into a space by walkers. In the same way, an act of reading is a space produced by the practice of a particular place. A place in this sense is a written text, which is a place constituted by the system of signs, rights, in the simpler terms, um, we constantly perform places in the spaces, right? Even in the mere act of using the computer, picking an outfit, and deciding what to eat for dinner um, is an act of transforming places into spaces. At this point, I know some of you may be confused or some of you may have a lot of questions in your mind right now. But don't worry because before we end this presentation, I've prepared four crucial points in the practice of everyday life by Michelle Desirto. First, it teaches us that everyday life is tactical in nature. Whether we admit it or not, it is what it is. So let's say you're reading a famous novel. Its tactic in a way where each person reads a text differently based on his or her needs and experiences, of course, and draws different meaning from it. Second, users or consumers have ingenious ways in which the weak, which are the users and consumers obviously, make use of the strong. This is in connection with his idea that ordinary people are not merely passive and submissive consumers but active and can manipulate the environment around them through everyday actions. Now third, consumption has a central meaning in our daily lives. The idea of placing ourselves in society, for example by appropriating meanings, considers consumption as production. 
Through this perspective, the consumer is understood to be a creator whose actions are carried out through a cultural process. Lastly, he points out that the resistance by people and by group and their awareness by it varies. Meaning, some people may actively work to oppose the prevailing ideology, while others may be comfortable with their place in society and unintentionally undeterminate. On behalf of Group 5, we would like to thank you all for listening and we do hope that you've learned a lot.